Welcome to my regenerative soil laboratory. I'm Matt Powers, author, gardener, seed saver, regenerative soil expert, and family guy. And I teach people all over the world how to live more regeneratively, how to have soil that gets better every single season, every single year. Many people ask me, should I get a microscope? And what's the benefit? What's the real benefit? And is it the cost ratio really there for getting a microscope? Well, I'll tell you the how and the why of soil microscopy, the benefits, the limitations, all of it in this video. And then afterward, I have an idea I want to share with you about how we can next level things, community source solutions to see past the current limitations on microscopy in the current study. So let's begin. Well, number one, it's really simple. I mean, you can have a $200 to $400 microscope. Um, this one is much more expensive than that. Uh, the base model of this is over $1,000, uh, but it also has a module on it that allows us to see at a different spectrum of light. So this is like a super special model, but you can get one for $200. You can get one used for $100. I know people have done that. And you have a microscope, you have slides, and you have slide covers and you get a sample and you dilute it one to 10. Um, and, and you just, you know, shake it up. You let it settle a little bit and you have a specific way to shake it. <laughs> There's timing for everything, but you just take a sample of this and put a drop or two on a slide and then put the cover on it. These two things. And then you look at it under there, usually just in the bright field. Most people aren't going to get the, the, the epifluorescence module on top, which allows you to see another level, which we'll talk about later on. But, but yeah, that's what they do. And this is what they see. They can see spores. They can see testate amoeba, two different kinds. Um, they can see a variety of, of organisms. And you can see bacteria. If we move around, we can see some fungi. There might be actually some sporulating fungi on the right. But my, my, my point is you, you, can, you can visualize all of these things with a microscope that can go up to 400x. It can go up to 1,000x, which is the maximum resolution that microscopes go to. After that, you're zooming in, and it doesn't sharpen the picture anymore. So if someone's trying to sell you a 2,000x resolution, that's just weird because that doesn't exist. Everyone who understands optics and physics around, around optics understands that. So the, you just need a microscope like that. That's all the investment that it takes. And then you just put a drop on, you know, on a slide and then you put it under there and you view it. And it's, it's really, I mean, if you have worked with microscopes in high school, this is easy. And it's not hard to learn how to do. If you've never used a microscope, it's easy. <laughs> That's the crazy thing about this is it's not hard if you do it the right way. And for years, I mean, I only learned from one person initially. And so for years, it was very, very hard for me to use the microscopes as they were. And now that I understand how I, I, like, I really need it, <laughs> separate. Um, I need a screen that I look at separate from there. I've never used these. Never, ever. I get headaches. Um, and when I do it the right way, I can work for hours and hours and it's very enjoyable. This is in 4k. So, so, and there's a lot, there's, a, there's HD cameras that can go on AM scope things. I have a whole rig and set up for that too. You can have your iPhone connected to it. Uh, and, and there's like a holder for your iPhone that goes on one of the eyepieces. There's so many different ways that you can visualize so it's easier on the eyes. But the idea is that you view, you analyze, and evaluate soil samples to tell you what your site needs, what your site has, and what your site potentially could have. Because you can see kind of <laughs> where things are headed sometimes. <laughs> And so it's, it's, yeah, yeah, you can see a lot of things, but let's, let's start off at the basics because the first thing you're going to do when you set up the microscope, when you're looking at things, you're going to say to yourself, is there life or is this dead dirt? You're going to look to see if there's nothing but minerals. 
for for a lot of us and a lot of soils on a lot of places that we rent or places that we just get to or we're never that have never been treated properly it's dead dirt and so you'll see nothing in there and a lot of you know um, soil amendments that say they have this that and the other you look inside and they're teeming with things that don't look good and so you know who is in there also becomes the next layer and so you identify the types of things in there which is also very easy to do and then you decide if it's balanced and that's also very easy to do i mean is it like how many nematodes per drop of soil you know and and then who morphologically this is harder you have to try to identify the through the mouth parts the esophagus parts uh, and sometimes other other attributes of the nematodes the ciliates have you know various attributes most of them indicate anaerobic but some of them indicate transitioning into aerobic so uh, subtleties and things right so and then the thing is it balanced because the next question follows that is are the nutrients biologically cycling and then how are they cycling and how well can we infer from that is it in a balanced system and and so when we look at most of the soil and compost samples that i get there's testate amoebas in them whether it's johnson sioux compost or catalyst bio amendments compost or or even uh in, in students compost and so these things tell you the ways that things are being re like cycled and recycled through the system what things are being amped up and where things can lead to. You can see from how it's working, everything's getting locked up, if everything's getting stopped at this point in the cycle. You begin to see and understand these things. And then you can diagnose very quickly, looking at a soil, what's missing. And so you, you, might, you might find yourself identifying on your roots root feeding nematodes, and they have this spike that stabs through and makes a hole. And so then you're, you might be applying predatory nematodes, which are much bigger. They've got a cool little like mouth that like, yeah, take down uh, other nematodes that are smaller than them. So there's so m much to this, but then at a certain point you get it and it's exploration because morphological categorization is not truly identification. We can narrow things down, but with like bacteria, for instance, we can't tell pathogenic E. coli from other E. coli or other bacilli. They're all bacilli nondescript shaped. And in fact, E. coli cover like everything and like 40% to 50% of bacteria everywhere all the time. And it's commensal and it's cool and it's normal and it's part of decomposition. It's part of endophytes inside of plants. It's part of rhizophagy. It's all these different things. But identifying, it's key that businesses like Catalyst Bio Amendments does DNA testing. They work with biomakers. Biomakers is really cool. And the, all, these, all these compost companies are testing for DNA to make sure that their piles don't have pathogens of any sorts. And that's awesome. That's, that's really important to do. And, and that's the thing is it's a marriage of these two worlds. That is, that's the reason why I'm actually writing a trilogy for regenerative soil. So it's regenerative soil, regenerative soil microscopy, which I'm launching June 16th and regenerative soil DNA, which I'm researching and compiling information on regenerative microscopy is already primary. Well, it's already written. I haven't written the conclusion and I need it. I need it soundly edited and I need to put all the photos and arrange them. I have all the photos and I, I literally could just throw it all together and start ironing it out and take two to three months and finish it really, really, really nicely and then make the course and all that. So stay tuned for that. Number five, counting and measuring. So you've identified things and now y you really want to know the balance, not just from like a hip shot generalization, what you can see 
and from like the nematode, like how many per drop, like our ciliates, like how many per drop, we can do that very quickly. But the bacterial, the fungal, that's some calculation. And it's also guesstimation and complete generalization because the sample size that we take is so small and the soil is so varied that we really need to do a lot of tests to establish a proper generalization even of fungal to bacterial ratios. So counting and measuring, this is dilution, this is using hemocytometers, this is using grids, and this is also now using new methods that I'm working on because this is the thing, and you could work on this too. Once, once it's understood that all labs have their own methodology for counting bacteria, it becomes clear that you could like study a bunch of them and come up with your own that's tailored to work for your medium, for your goal. So that's what I did because I, there, there's, there's so much more information now about soil microscopy at the university level, at the commercial level, at the independent level, uh, and, and in the literature and the research. And so I've just like with regenerative soil, my book that has, that has completely changed me and completely changed everything I teach. And it's my most popular book that I've ever written. It's, it's, it's truly exciting. And the second edition is out, so check that out for sure. This is another level like that. It's another opening the door because the new protocols and new methods, they like when we're counting, how do you know what is alive and what is not? Well, some experts have proposed FDA, flu uh, fluorescence uh, diacetate. And that lights up everything with living tissue green. And well, there's an argument that some things it doesn't actually light up. There is an old stain that is out of frequency. It's supposedly out of frequency in some of the literature. And I figured out that you can use it in frequency in a, in the frequency that this microscope uses if you mess with the brightness. So you can't do it directly with these. You just blind yourself. But if you put it through a 4K and you tweak the image, like all of us know how to tweak images now. I mean, pff, all of our phones have that capability. But like the scientists, you know, haven't been doing this. So, so I just move the brightness down and I can very clearly see live dead stain. So I, a live dead stain allows us to count the, the living biology from the dead biology. And this itself also will tell you who's feeding on what. So, so, so you, you suddenly can, can tell how much of a sample is alive, how much of a sample is dead in a generalized way. And then when you do grid counting, you actually are accurately counting all the live active biology and not the inactive or dead biology. And sometimes this can be, especially with anaerobic samples, it's like flipping a light switch on their situation and being like, oh, you guys, ah, you know? And so this live dead stain is a massive breakthrough. I, these things are usually hundreds and hundreds of dollars. They come in a kit and they're very expensive, but I figured out how to use something for under a hundred dollars that when we dilute it twice, we can then use two to four drops at a time per sample. And then that whole sample experience can continue on for your whole session, just on those two to four drops. So it's something that's being used for malarial drugs. It's something that's being used to fight cancer. If you just read the literature, it's like, it's not, going to show you at the frequency that they think but it was they decided that because it's an old stain before they had that and the capability to tweak the images and lower the brightness so you actually see 
who is creating that massive amount of light. It is a huge breakthrough and I, I am so excited because it's a problem. You know what I mean? For, for me, when I discovered it, it was like this huge problem. It's like, how do we know we're getting accurate counts? Accuracy was like the biggest deal to me. Like when I started looking into this actual thing, trying to marry what the academics and the commercial are doing, which what the independent people are doing and learning. And I want it all to work together in a system that we all can communicate and contribute to something that will allow us to move faster in a public and transparent way as a community. So I'll talk about that a little bit later on, but, but this, this, this attachment on this microscope is a huge part of these new methodologies. This stain wouldn't show up without it. And if you used FDA, you'd still have to use this model and you wouldn't see the live dead and it's LED because in the past there were mercury vapor lamps and they cost $30,000. This is not that. And, and students of my, my, my course get a 40% discount on all of this. So they save thousands of dollars. So you should check out regenerative soil self-paced and it's lifetime access to every year's live run through, but you know, you know, no, no pressure. Um, but, but let's talk about that unit because, um, I think every community lab should have one and everyone in the community should be able to use it. They're rugged, they're LEDs. You're not gonna have like a mercury light bulb explosion because they explode. That's why you have to stop using them before they're actually done because you can't reach the end because they explode. Isn't it good to live in the modern day? <laughs> <laughs> Epifluorescence is so much cooler than just the live dead stain or counting microbes, which is going to be taken over by AI soon enough. You just submit your, your video segment to the AI and it'll count all that for you especially if you do it through the epifluorescence, you just record the epifluorescence. I mean, we're at the point now where you take several snapshots of the same thing at different depths and you submit it to the computer and it gives you back a 3D image from these kinds of microscopes. So, and, and I'm waiting for them to transfer it to Mac so that I can do it. Uh, it's still PC. So there is so much going on and so much on the horizon waiting for us in this space. But epifluorescence, especially with the LED, is a breakthrough. So highly accurate, very beautiful images, and you can non-destructively view fungi. So before you would have to use all these crazy, terrible, destructive stains and acids and, and other things that would destroy the root but make these really cool looking pictures. But something that destroys it in order to create a picture isn't actually taking a picture of it, in my opinion. This is a big problem with so much of the old university way of doing soil microscopy, where they're bathing things in different chemicals, they're doing agar slabs and using flames to like adhere it to the slide. And, and then they're looking at it and assessing it. How is that normal or anything close to reality? This is much closer to reality because epifluorescence is in the wavelength, the, the, the light wavelength that most of these microbes see at. And how do I know this? Well, the fungi glow. They create glowing crystals that indicate where they have been and they, where they solubilize phosphorus and then they pull it through themselves like, a, like straws through their body, their mycelium. And you see the glowing, my you see the glowing phosphorus flowing through them. It's amazing. The crystals are also really beautiful. But this this is their they are literally guiding microbes to them with their light in that frequency. I'm not doing adding any stain. We're literally seeing this light emanate from these parts of the soil. So where fungi has been feeding organic matter, where fungi is, where fungi has been, and it shows what fungi is doing, 
it's incredible. And then you see things like pinworms with hairs that are glowing from phosphorus consumption. They're fungal feeders, and right? And so we're seeing that, that diet manifest in the hairs. And they actually form a very interesting pattern, which may be visual to other pinworms. This may be like a male. And this is the first time I've ever seen it documented. I can't find anything in the literature on this. This is the frontier. And discoveries like this are being made all the time. And that's why we need to think about this more as an open source community issue that we need to face together and work out together and explore together and share what we find and, and map that out. So this is the idea. I want to be able to have an online database for soil microbes, but also as well for all the other testing methods so that we see them together march through all the spectrums. So the soils with like high nitrogen and low nitrogen, like what's the population look like in those soils? What does the cycling look like in those soils in, when their pH changes? What does the DNA testing show for those soils? Because many of us are now doing home DNA sequencing. The reality is, is that all this is going to connect and create in a public database a way that we can see across pHs, bioregions, across radox, across salinity, conductivity, and then NPK, and then all, all the micronutrients, all the minerals, paramagnetism, all the testing methods. What if we had a database where we encouraged a comparison of as many test markers as possible across the spectrum? so that we could actually map the correlations and deeper meanings. And then everyone can literally see those things and understand how they work. This is the future. This is how, you know, community source solutions come to the fore. We create a database that we all can upload into the course and book or how to do the microscopy part. The third part of my series, Regenerative Soil DNA, is going to be how to interpret and do the DNA work. And then we're gonna put them all together and that's going to be the most sophisticated public soil database ever assembled. And it's going to be viewable. The results are gonna be viewable by everyone. And members can like download the actual DNA sequencing They'll be able to take any parameter and measure it against each other and generate their own data and charts based upon all the, the different things that they're comparing, their different bioregions, because it's going to be like endlessly manipulatable data because it's so simple on one hand, but also there'll be over a hundred different points of distinction. So that's what I'm talking about. That's what this this next project is going to be. It's going to be Regenerative Soil Microscopy, the book, the full in-depth online course where you'll learn how to do all of this. You'll learn how to evaluate it all. You'll have all the formulas, the metrics, the charts, everything that'll guide you. And then you'll have the ability to upload and folks that have training from other folks can add theirs and compare what they're doing to other people and see the quality of their work, see the interpretation of their work. And we're gonna have ratings on things so that the community can let you know about your pictures, how much they love them, and that you can, you can get recognition for all the work you're doing. And this research can be publicly accessible. So this community citizen soil science database our soil database can provide the pieces that we need to go forward. So I invite all of you to dig deep with me 
with regenerative soil microscopy and our soil database. This Kickstarter campaign that starts June 16th could already be begun. Please click the link below and join us. It's going to be like nothing I've ever done before. This is going to be bigger than anything I've ever done because soil is the linchpin to all life, to all health, to the future of everyone. Join me. I'm Matt Powers. Grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively. I'll see you soon. Click the link below and join us. Thank you. <laughs>